I am very excited to chat with today's guest. We have Dr. Ben White, and we're going to be talking about a functional medicine approach to thyroid autoimmunity. And Dr. Ben will also be discussing his personal experience with thyroid autoimmunity. So excited about that. And so I'm going to dive into Dr. Ben's bio, and then we're going to dive into the conversation. So Dr. Ben White is a certified sports chiropractor and functional medicine practitioner for more than 35 years, and he has worked with professional sports teams. He wrote a book in 1998, The Back Relief Book, and has published several papers on the prevention of injuries and weight training, and he is currently working on a book on longevity. He has a weekly podcast, Rational Wellness, which is now in its sixth year, and this is devoted to all things functional medicine. His office is in Santa Monica, California, and he sees patients both for functional medicine and for chiropractic therapy. And thank you so much for being here, Dr. Ben. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm, I'm excited to be joining you and sharing some knowledge with your viewers. Yes. You know, I was on, you know, Dr. Ben's podcast and, you know, we had a great time chatting and I'm sure this conversation is going to be great too. And so let's get into a little bit of your background. So, you know, so you're, you started off as a certified, like as doing sports medicine, sports chiropractic, which you still do, but how did you get into the functional medicine side? You know, I think it started because um, even prior to becoming a chiropractor, I got involved in bodybuilding and I, I started learning about how to change my body composition. How do I reduce my body fat? How do I eat in a way to maximize muscle mass and reduce body fat and and started learning how to change body composition? And that got me interested in nutrition and as and uh, so then as part of my chiropractic practice, I thought, well, I can help other people to get in better shape, reduce their body fat. And then one of the first things that happened while I was um, uh, practicing chiropractic, I think my first year in practice, Dr. Jeffrey Bland gave this seminar for metagenics. And I went to that seminar and it just blew my mind. For those who don't know, Dr. Jeffrey Bland is the father of functional medicine. And he he would give these seminars that you your neurons in your brain were just tingling afterwards. And um, at the time, uh, he was working with Metagenics. And Metagenics would often send somebody out like the next week to just explain what Dr. Bland was telling everybody. And uh, so I got really excited and, and that became an annual thing. Every year I would go to w watch Dr. Jeffrey Bland. For me, it was like going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty cool. I didn't know he was associated with metagenics for a while. You know, I, I went through the IFM Institute of Functional Medicine training. And of course he's affiliated with them. Well, and, he started uh, the Institute yeah. of Functional Medicine. Yeah, exactly. So, but I didn't know, um, I guess prior to that is when he was with Metagenics or? Yeah. I mean, he started um, his own company, Healthcom, that made the medical foods. And then they, they linked up with Metagenics and he became the science officer for Metagenics. And, um, and then, uh, you know, did that for many years. And um, of course, he, um, he started the Institute of Functional Medicine, and most people credit him as being the father of functional medicine. The other thing is he would put out this monthly tape of information about um, functional medicine. It started out as PMU, Preventative Medicine Update, and I would get these little cassette tapes, and at the time, uh, every car would have a cassette player, so I would put it in the cassette player. <laughs> and then eventually uh, they switched to um, CDs and uh, I would get the CD and I would put that into uh, my car and listen to it in the car. And then eventually went to, um, it eventually became a podcast and it ended. And that was a sad day because I remember I still had paid for um, that year's subscription. And they said, well, sorry, we're going to have to refund you. But um, it was great. I used to love getting those updates from Dr. Bland every month. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely is a wealth of knowledge. And uh, yeah, I'm not, I miss those days with the cassette tapes. It's, you know, just, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, I mean, I, not not that I don't enjoy the modern technology in the podcast, but just uh, brings back good memories. <laughs> so, so, so let's dive into autoimmunity. What, why, can you explain why, do, at least some of the reasons why you think autoimmunity is so, so, so much more prevalent these days? Because I mean, going back, to the days of cassette tapes, <laughs> really, you didn't hear much, you know, like 10, 20, well, maybe 10 years ago, but like 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, again, definitely wasn't as as popular. And obviously, we have better diagnostics these days, but it just does seem like there's a lot more people with autoimmune conditions. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any data to know 100% for sure, but I believe it's most likely related to the modern diet the modern food system where um, we're eating so much processed food and hybridized um, products, uh, fruits and vegetables. And um, so many of the foods are sprayed with pesticides and the animals are sprayed with chemicals and uh, high levels of toxins that we're exposed to in the environment, not only on our food, in our air, in our water, in, in you know, we're constantly getting exposed to toxic products that um, stress our immune system. They're in the chemicals we put on our skin. They're in the pots, in nonstick pans we cook with. They're embedded in our furniture and our car seats. And, and so I think the modern world is an assault on our immune system. Yeah, I agree. There's no question that, you know, what we eat, you know, the air we breathe and the water we drink, all these factors are are huge. And it's unfortunately not getting any better. I mean, the good news is that podcasts like that mine and yours and many others are bringing more awareness. So people are becoming more aware and they're, you know, they're eating organic and they're purifying their water and they're trying to do other things to reduce their toxic load. Uh, but still, it's 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 a uh, uphill battle and uh you know so you you have your background what or you know you were diagnosed at Hashimoto's and so I'm imagining when it comes to working with people not that you exclusively work with autoimmune people with autoimmune conditions but I'm sure you see a fair share of people with autoimmune conditions and Hashimoto's being that it's the most common autoimmune thyroid condition I'm guessing that might be the most common autoimmune condition you see in your practice or um, I don't know if it's the most common one I see, but I know it is the most common autoimmune condition. Yeah. So I, you know, we certainly have tons of patients with uh, Hashimoto's um, and um, uh, you know, myself, I, I diagnosed it myself uh, for years. I actually had a um, elevated TSH level and the TSH is the hormone that's secreted by the, pituitary to tell the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormones. So if that's elevated above, people have different numbers, but three or four, or some people even say two and a half. Anyways, mine was um, uh, around seven to eight for quite a number of years, but I, I ignored it. Nobody paid any attention to it. And um, it, I, I never had any of the symptoms. I didn't have fatigue. I didn't have weight gain, hair loss, any of those types of symptoms. And you know, I I I like to run my labs pretty regularly, a couple of times a year, and I do pretty detailed labs on myself. And so I've been monitoring it for a number of years. My uh, TPO thyroid antibodies um, have been mildly elevated, but not excessive. Say. 120, 100, um, right in that range. So normal is below 30. Ideally, you probably shouldn't have any uh, antibodies to our thyroid, but um, you know, not generally considered something to really worry about. So I basically ignored it for a number of years. And in one year, my TSH level went up to nine. And so I was searching around for some strategies to try to help myself deal with it. And um, I, I've been hearing about the high dose iodine concept for quite a number of years. And um, 
Um, you know, it always seemed uh, wrong to me, but, um, you know, uh, the, there's um, one very famous uh, naturopathic doctor, I think, right? Or is he a medical doctor? Brownstein, he's medical. Yeah, Brownstein, MD, he's a medical med- doctor, yeah. So he's been talking about these super high doses of iodine. So I said, you know what? Let's give it a shot. So I went on 12 and a half. So for people who don't know, iodine is the backbone of the thyroid hormone. So when they talk about T3 or T4 as the different thyroid hormones, T3 has three iodine molecules. T4 has four iodine molecules. And you have to have adequate iodine or that can lead to thyroid problems. And for many years before thyroid autoimmunity became the problem, the big problem for hypothyroidism in this country was um, was that people had goiters from lack of iodine. And so the Midwest was considered the goiter belt. So it was very common. People would have these enlarged thyroids because the thyroid would be working hard to produce more thyroid hormone. And it's all because the soil there was low in iodine. And so many years ago, the United States started um, adding iodine to our salt. We have iodized salt. And that was done specifically to reduce um, hypothyroidism. And so we saw levels of um, goiter drop um, incredibly, but at the same time, levels of autoimmunity went up. And we've seen the same thing in Iran and other countries around the world, when they added iodine to, they supplemented the diet uh, with iodine, typically by adding iodine salt. So anyway, um, in this country, most people have enough iodine, but myself being a healthcare practitioner and a fanatic for natural health, I haven't used iodine salt for years. So I figured, you know, there's really no super accurate way to measure iodine. There's the iodine loading test. You can do serum iodine, but none of those are really considered super accurate. So I thought, you know, maybe I don't have enough iodine because I've been using the pink Himalayan salt or the sea salt, and I haven't used iodine salt for probably a decade or longer. So I started taking the Iodorol, which is the brand product with, uh, I took the one with 12 and a half milligrams of iodine, whereas the average multivitamin will have 150 micrograms like 0.15 of uh, of iodine. And so unfortunately, my TSH levels went the wrong direction. They went up to like over 25 from nine. So I realized, okay, that's not right. <clears throat> so what to do next? Stop iodine, stop even eating seaweed or any other sources of iodine. And um, then I started... Um, I did a a stool test to look at my gut because I've had IBS sort of symptoms off and on for years, nothing too major, but um, I found some things to work on in my gut. So I started taking some antimicrobials and, and worked on some other gut support. At the same time, I had done a Nutri eval, which is this comprehensive nutrition evaluation. And the ingredient that came up that I lacked the most was zinc. So I decided, you know what? I'm not taking extra selenium. So let me add some extra selenium. And and then at the same time, I'd also looked at some um, uh, a genetic test that showed that I had a couple of genes that make it difficult for me to absorb zinc. So... That made sense. Even though I had been taking some zinc, I realized I need to take more zinc. And rather than take a big dosage at one time, I decided to take 15 milligrams in addition to my multi and take it like four times a day, possibly increase the absorption by taking it different times of the day. And um, so I I added the zinc. Um, My vitamin D level 
which I, my goal is to keep vitamin D for most patients in the 50 to 70 range. And mine was in the mid forties, I would get it up to 50 and it drops back to 40. And this is, I live in Southern California. I, I don't get a ton of sun, but I do play golf. And so I do get a, a certain amount of sun and yet very difficult to get my vitamin D level up. So I said, you know, let's really hit the vitamin D and experiment with different formulations of vitamin D, fat soluble versus water soluble. And, um, and started taking um, between five and 10,000. The 5,000 wasn't really cutting it for me. So I started taking 10,000 for a couple of months and then alternating between five and 10. Got my vitamin D level up, <clears throat> um, got my zinc level up, um, and, and then uh, also added some magnesium and brought my TSH level down to 4.7. So I had, I had gone in to see my primary care doctor. So what I do before I see my primary care doctor is do my own lab work and then bring it into him because the lab work that uh, that is allowed through insurance is pretty minimal. Now, most people don't realize this because what they do to make the lab work look better, the typical lab work you'll get from your annual physical is basically a chem screen, a CBC, and maybe a basic lipid profile. Now, um, a chem screen is a pretty basic test going through an automatic machine. It's like 10, 12 tests, something like that. But they'll put each test on a separate sheet of paper to make it look like it's a lot of testing. And then they'll do the same thing with the CBC. They'll put each particular part of it on a separate sheet of paper. And um, and patients come in, see me all the time, and they go, I had all my labs done. So obviously nothing's wrong, which nothing could be further from the truth because of all the amount of lab tests they had done, they had this much done, but it looked like a lot. So anyway, so I run my detailed labs and then I bring them into my doctor and show them to me. And when my TSH had gone up to 25, he had seen me and he, he said, why don't you take some thyroid? I, I said, look, I, I don't mind taking thyroid if I need it. I would definitely take it. Um, but even though my TSH is high and I know it's very high, so far, my free T3 and my free T4 are still within range. Are they at the top of the range? No, but I don't have fatigue. I'm not having any of the other symptoms. So at this point, let me try to work on some of the underlying causes of autoimmunity. Let me try to um, promote better thyroid health. And so then when I brought my TSH down, he just shook his head. He knew, of course, when he suggested taking thyroid that I probably wouldn't take it. So you've never been on thyroid hormone replacement? Never been on thyroid hormone replacement. Never taken a prescription medication, really, other than maybe taking a painkiller for a day or two after surgery. That is awesome. And yeah, the high dose iodine, I have my own experience with high dose iodine in the what, past. What and happened I, to you? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I was dealing with uh, Graves disease, uh, even prior to that, so prior to that, uh, when I was not doing the functional medicine part and just the chiropractic, I still attended conferences that focused on nutrition, standard process seminars, as you're probably familiar with. And and they had some functional endocrinology seminars. And so I, whenever I went to those seminars, they spoke about iodine and the thyroid, and they were proponents of the high dose iodine and brought up Dr. David Brownstein's work. And I read his book, you know, that like you did iodine, why you need it, why you can't live without it. So when I dealt with Graves disease, I took high dose iodine, just because again, that's what I learned prior to being diagnosed. And my experience was fine. I mean, it, it actually, my TSH also, it didn't skyrocket to 25, but with Graves' disease, you get the undetectable TSH typically, and it did, uh, and it increased. Now, I was doing other things. I was taking bugleweed, which is an herb with antithyroid properties. And and actually, I took the bugleweed before the iodine. So I think even before I took the iodine, things were kind of normalizing it and the the iodine pushed it a little bit more towards that 
hypo side, but my experience was, was, was okay. It didn't worsen my conditions. And at least it didn't seem like it, obviously things this, the 2009, I've been in remission since then, but yeah, over the years, I saw good and bad with iodine, you know, I saw a lot now, of people- Now, what would be the rationale for why iodine could help with hyperthyroidism? So what, when you take high dose iodine, it has like a ne- the opposite effect where it could actually push someone more towards the hypo side. And in fact, many years ago, pra- some practitioners would use that instead of radioactive iodine, you know, sometimes instead of antithyroid medication, such as methimazole. So yeah, like it, huh. when, when you think about it, it doesn't make sense. It's like iodine is important for the formation of thyroid hormone. So right. why would you want to take higher dose iodine? And it is, and, and in some people, it definitely makes them more hyper. Some people, it exacerbates the autoimmune response. I mean, so again, it definitely has risk and it's not the approach I take these days. I'm just sharing my experience because it was similar to yours and that, you know, and I, and I did the iodine loading test myself. I didn't, um, it sounds like you didn't do the testing. You just decided no. to, to experiment. So I, I did what Brownstein recommended to the high, you know, the iodine, did the iodine loading test and it showed that I was deficient, but yeah, um, iodine ca- does have the potential to lower thyroid hormones. The problem is in some people it could do the opposite. And in some people it can exacerbate that autoimmune response. I've had, you know, I've seen some people where it worsens thyroid eye disease, which is common with Graves. So yeah, I the approach I take today, I'm not, I'm definitely not anti-iodine. If if someone's you know, like I don't I have no problems giving a multivitamin with iodine or having people eat some foods that have iodine, whether it be, you know, some seafood or eggs. But as far as the high dose iodine supplements, yeah, I usually stay away from that. You know, as far as my patients recommend them not to to do that. And then same thing with like sea vegetables. I'm more cautious with them eating like seaweed and kelp and those right. foods. So so yeah, it's a, it's a definitely controversial. I mean, there's a book out there, which you might've heard of called the, um, is it the thyroid reset diet where they write, where the author recommends like 200 micrograms of iodine or less per day. And, um, again, I, I'm not saying some people don't need a real low iodine diet, but, um, you know, it comes down to everybody being different. And, uh, but I do think the real high dose, cause you mentioned you took 12.5 milligrams, you know, uh, there are some people take that, have taken, I'm sure still taking like 50 milligrams, taking a lot higher doses. Yep. So yeah. Um, now you said you had a stool test done. So what, do you remember what the stool test showed? Um, let's see. It, it showed basically dysbiosis. It wasn't anything too dramatic, but um, overgrowth of some bacteria that shouldn't be there. And um, uh, maybe some of the commensals lacking a little bit. So I, I, I took some antimicrobials and then followed it up with a uh, gut repair program. Um, so nutrients that specifically support gut health, um, which includes things like glutamine and mucilaginous herbs, as well as taking probiotics and prebiotics. You okay. know, I, I generally employ some version of the 4R program. So want to remove those foods that are causing problems. We want to replace digestive enzymes, maybe hydrochloric acid. And then we we want to remove excess overgrowth of bacteria, remove um, parasites, remove um, protozoans, remove fungal overgrowth, um, remove uh, pathogenic bacteria, et cetera. And then we want to rebuild after that. So when it comes to triggers, so, I mean, you've already spoken about some of them, like you just mentioned, you know, like parasites and other microbes. And we spoke a little bit about food and environmental toxins, how that's a big factor with uh, autoimmunity. Uh, I mean, what are those like some of the more common triggers? Like, what do you say, like infections in, in your experience is like up there, like maybe, you know, the top one or two, or is it more food or just you see multiple triggers? Like, what do you see in your practice? Yeah, I see multiple triggers. Um, but I mean, basically, you can break down the triggers for. Um, so so what we're talking about is 
um, things that our immune system reacts to, which then ends up causing our immune system to turn around and react to our own cells, organs, tissues, um, and w which is what we refer to as autoimmunity. When our immune system is attacking us instead of outside invaders. So you can brace, basically break it down into food sensitivities, uh, toxins, and infections. And then you could make God a separate category, but um, so, you know, those are the main categories. And so I, I think that um, it's toxins. Unfortunately, we live in a super toxic world and even trying to eat clean and stay away from toxic products it's impossible completely. So everybody's going to have some level of toxins, unfortunately. How about stress? Do you, do you consider stress to be a trigger as well? Uh, sure. Stress is, is, is a trigger as well. And we often see that as uh, problems with adrenal function. And, um, and then you know, many of us have some level of chronic infections. As most of us now know, now that we're all experts on viruses, that any virus you've ever had in your life, every cold, et cetera, um, remains in your body to some extent as the immune system remembers it. And so um, what can happen is you can have some infection that um, the acute phase cleared, but is still smoldering at a lower level or some virus that gets reactivated. Like one of the things we've seen with post-COVID is reactivation of some of these chronic viruses like Epstein-Barr and herpes virus, et cetera. And, and those can kind of smolder at a low level and that can play a factor as a trigger in autoimmunity. And, and the mechanism by which infections food sensitivities, toxins can lead to autoimmunity. Um, uh, the, the main understanding of how that works has to do with something called molecular mimicry. So what that means is, let's say you have a, um, a, a food sensitivity to gluten, which is a food a protein found in wheat. And so then your immune system forms antibodies to, um, to gluten. And then the gluten is a protein, and that protein structure is similar enough to some of the proteins found in the thyroid or the thyroid hormone receptor. And then those antibodies, instead of just attacking the um, gluten, they attack your thyroid or your thyroid receptors in the case of um, hyperthyroidism or some other tissue in your body. So the, the, your immune system ends up attacking ourselves. And that's that's what autoimmunity is. So from a functional medicine perspective, in addition to helping to control the symptoms initially, we want to find out some of these underlying triggers and then remove as many of them as we can. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, sometimes it's challenging to do that. Sometimes it's challenging to find the triggers, but but I agree, we need to uh, do our best as functional medicine practitioners. And, you know, speaking of finding triggers, so when it comes to like viruses or, I mean, even parasites, but let's, let's talk about viruses. So a lot of people, if not most people have Epstein-Barr. So just having, would you agree that just having Epstein-Barr doesn't mean that it's a problem? Like in, in a lot of people with not just thyroid conditions, but other autoimmune conditions or just people in general, there are people that have it where it's not an issue. Would you agree with that? Um, sure. But, but the question is, what is the level? I, I We typically test for antibodies to Epstein-Barr rather than just seeing some traits of Epstein-Barr. Um, so when it comes to infections like Epstein-Barr, just the mere presence of the virus is not the problem. The question is, to what extent your immune system is mounting a response to Epstein-Barr, to the extent to which you're actively forming antibodies. So therefore, rather than measuring um, whether there's Epstein-Barr virus in the system, we typically measure antibodies. And then we look at 
whether there is a sufficient amount of antibodies that it looks like Epstein-Barr is potentially having a factor on your health. And then parasites. So parasites, if they show up on a stool test, do you always address them or does it depend on the parasite? Well, um, like everything related to health and especially functional medicine, there is controversies about parasites. So one of the controversies are, are any of the parasites actually commensal? Now, I know some people will be aghast. What do you mean? Parasite is a good thing? Well, it turns out that in societies where parasites, in fact, where worms are endemic in people's guts, um, autoimmunity is uh, much less prevalent. So one of the theories about autoimmunity is that our immune systems don't have enough to do because we grow up in a sterile environment and people who um, have parasites uh, the immune system is busy taking care of those and less likely to react against us. But um, so anyway, so there are certain parasites that will show up, particularly protozoans like Diantamoeba dia, dia, fragilis, D fragilis, and uh, Blastocystis hominis. And there are prominent people in the functional medicine world. I've had discussions with Jason Herlick, who's one of the top experts at the microbiome and publishes the Probiotic Advisor, which is a great resource for information on probiotics. And he feels that most patients with either of those parasites, protozoans, that they're essentially commensal and you don't need to go after them. So in, in my case, if I see blastocystis hominis, and um, it depends on what's going on, we, you know, I, I'm going to consider it as something we might want to target. And I've had a number of patients where I think getting rid of blasto was a major factor in restoring your health. So I think it depends on the, on the patient, you know, I... Um, there's, there's a lot of things that are controversial. I, For example, um, H. pylori is a bacteria that is found in the stomach. It can be found on a stool test. And, you know, I interviewed Dr. Steven Sandberg-Lewis, who's one of the world's uh, functional medicine gastroenterologists. And he says, in most cases, leave H. pylori alone. Don't even test for it. But I just recently had a patient who's had chronic reflux for years, and we've done all kinds of things. And now that we saw it on a stool test and targeted it, his whole life has completely changed. This reflux that he's had for his entire life is now gone. His life is so much better just using some herbs that reduce H. pylori. So I think it depends. I agree. I think we share the same perspective. And and yeah, I, I think, you know, also I interviewed Dr. Horlick as well. And and so we had that conversation about blastocystis as well. And then Narala Jacoby, who actually lives pretty close by to Dr. Horlick, um, she focuses on SIBO. She also shared that perspective on the podcast too about blastocystis hominis. But yeah, I'm with you. I, if I see it, I, I mean, it's not like what H. pylori, for example, same thing. I mean, definitely if someone's experiencing reflux, you know, reflux like sy symptoms or uh, other like heartburn, definitely I say treat it. But there's also in the research, a correlation between H. pylori and Hashimoto's and Graves. Now correlation, as you know, doesn't always mean causation, but it's not like I'm recommending triple therapy antibiotics to patients with Correct. that. Like, like you, I'm taking more of a natural approach with the herbs. So it's not like we're wiping out all the, the good bacteria. And just, I, I go by like you, my experience too. If we, if we see it and if someone, you know, if someone comes to see me with Graves or Hashimoto's, which is typically the case. And if something, and if it, and if it shows up again, I'm not going to hit it hard with like, really, I mean, I can't, I don't have prescribing rights, like, you know, and you don't either, but even if I did with the knowledge I have now, I wouldn't recommend antibiotics or in the case of, you know, parasites, I wouldn't give like metronidazole or flagyl. I would still, you know, take more of an herbal approach 
but yeah, so there's definitely controversy with that. And I'm, I'm glad we're on the, the same page with that. And then what do you do to lower your toxic burden on a daily basis? Uh, examine the way you lead your life. Look at your house, look at your clothes, look at the things you put on your skin, um, eat organic as much as you can. You know, uh, if you're worried about the cost of organic, you know, um, then you can go to the environmental working group and they give you lists. Here's the foods, uh, 30 dozen. These are the ones that are going to be most sprayed with pesticides. So if you're going to eat these particular, you know, if you're going to eat an apple or you're going to eat a, a blueberry, you know, because they're, they, blueberries are grow close to the ground. They're not only sprayed with pesticides they're sprayed with fungicides um, uh, and probably herbicides. So, you know, at least eat those foods organic. Personally, I try not to eat anything that's not organic. And um, so that's number one. Use safe personal care products. Don't cook with Teflon. Don't store foods in plastic. Don't use plastic wrap. Don't use aluminum foil. Um, use glass containers. Um, try to lead a healthy lifestyle as much as you can. Don't drink tap water. Um, we use a reverse osmosis, uh, you know, multi, uh, um, multi type of uh, water purification system at our house. Um, so we got foods. Um, don't use toxic cleaning products. Don't use toxic um, uh, products to wash your clothes with. Um, um, don't even give toxic cleaning products to your housekeeper if you have a housekeeper because they're going to spray it all over the place. Don't hire a guy to come and spray pesticides all over your house. You know, find ways to deal with it as much as you can naturally. Um, you know, we'll use like a natural orange oil to kill bugs if we feel like we need to. Um, same thing with your pets. Try to avoid giving them, you know, um, uh, toxic chemicals. Um, try to avoid having carpet in your house. Um, don't buy a mattress that's sprayed with uh, flame retardant chemicals, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so those are the things that I'm thinking about. Don't use uh, toxic uh, air fresheners. Those are some of the most toxic. You know, if it, it just relabels, start learning what are the terms that you want to look for. Anything that says it has perfume in it or fragrance, it's got phthalates. You don't want to eat it. Don't buy anything in plastic. Um, you know, drink water out of a glass or um, steel water bottle. You know, people use these plastic water bottles and then they 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 worry about if the water bottle is going to get hot in their car or something. That water bottle's probably been sitting in the back of Costco or some warehouse at 100 degree weather for a long period of time before you even got it. So don't even drink those. Yeah, great points. And um, I also drink reverse osmosis water. So thanks for sharing that as well. And uh, do you do you do sauna or uh, any, uh, yes. I guess, yeah. We have an infrared sauna at my house. Okay, wonderful. That, uh, yeah, I do sauna as well. And, so you know, I go to the gym and sweat as well. Sweating is a way to help detoxify you. I periodically do a detox program a couple of times a year. Okay. What, like a 21 day, like a three week one or a two week one? No, I'll typically do like 10 days, you know, I'll do like the ultra clear renew and I'll supplement it with uh, liposomal glutathione and take some binders. All right. Wonderful. That, vitamin D. So I have a question with vitamin D. So you said you like to see the levels between 50 and 70. So you do the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test, correct? Yeah. I mean, I have done the 125 as well. And what's your thoughts on the 125? Uh, you know, there's this, you know, about the whole hypothesis about um, the Marshall hypothesis. Have you heard about this? 
Yeah, I I ask have you have you had Dr. Eric Balkavich on your show? No. Um, he he has a, a, a he has a book, the thyroid debacle, but he was talking about 125 hydroxy on my podcast, and and you probably are familiar with Ben Lynch, Dr. Ben Lynch, who yes. wrote the book Dirty yeah. Genes, and so yeah. um, I attended his seminar, one of his conferences a number of years ago, in I think 2016 or 17, and he was supporting 125 hydroxy vitamin Z. And yeah, the, when I, when I was in going through my master's in nutrition, they were saying, don't do that because of the comp compensatory, like the parathyroid glands co compensating and that typically you'll see 125 hydroxy elevated a lot of times when one, 125 hydroxy looks good or low, but you can't rely on 125. But his perspective, Dr. Balkavich is that's not true. And it just makes me think, because again, I'm like you, I've been taking, I take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D daily because I rely on the 25 hydroxy just because even when I went through Institute for Functional Medicine, that's what they also were talking about, the 25 hydroxy, not the 125. So it's just an interesting perspective. I just You know why we, 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 I went through a period where we were running a 125 on every patient. Uh, we, a number of years ago, we, we were using this one lab that had all these markers and included the 125. So I did that on, you know, hundred plus patients and it was hardly ever elevated. So I, I, I just think it's a very rare thing that that happens. And according to that a doctor who um, says, so the concept is, is you're, you're converting um, all your vitamin D over to the active form, the 125. So therefore you're, 25 always looks lower than it should. So therefore, you don't really need to take more vitamin D. That's the concept that you're talking about. And um, but apparently that happens in sarcoidosis and maybe one other very rare autoimmune disease and not in the common autoimmune diseases that we know. So I don't know. After running that uh 125 over a hundred times, I, I, I didn't see it elevated. So. Hmm. Interesting. So that, uh, that's my experience, but yeah, I, you know, it's always better to test rather than guess. Yeah. But, you know, we have to be judicious about how many tests we're going to run, you know, cause uh, these functional medicine tests are out of pocket for the patients and we use the lab that gives them a discount price, but it's still out of pocket. So I, I try not to do tests that don't change what I do clinically. All right. No, that sounds good and makes sense. That's what all practitioners should do. There's no reason to do testing if you're not going to do something based on the test results. Right. So that, Absolutely. But I, I do think it's better to test than to guess. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I'm, I definitely like testing, uh, you know, not overdoing it, just, but definitely looking to try to find answers. So I have one more question. I, I mean, I mean, there's so many people that don't even know. I mean, I, I, I picked up a guy uh, a month ago. He had no idea he had thyroid problems. His thyroid antibodies were over 500. And, and he was so him. grateful that I told him that he had hypothyroidism and, um, and, and so he's doing great now, but it, there's no way we would have known. He had no clue. His, you know, men typically don't even get their TSH measured. Uh, it's not part of your chem screen or your CBC. And, you know, it's it's just not done, especially for men, because hypothyroidism is much more common in women um, that typically uh, men with hypothyroidism are not often picked up. And the only way we would have picked that up is because we included that in our testing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's unfortunate that the, the medical model, they just do the basics, the bare minimum, whatever insurance will cover. Well, and that's the whole thing. You know, that's that's the thing that nobody really talks about is the healthcare system is controlled by insurance companies. And unfortunately, that's the case. So if and insurance companies want to pay for the most minimal amount of testing possible. And if doctors, you know, if your primary care doctor starts ordering a bunch of tests 
other than what the insurance companies recommend. They either won't pay for it and the patient will get stuck with a big bill or the doctor will get threatened by the insurance companies. Yeah. So one more question I have for you, Dr. Ben, is do you test people for a leaky gut or do you just assume that people have a leaky gut? So I typically do include zonulin as part of the gut test. So there's, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways you can test for leaky gut. As, as far as I'm concerned, I think the most accurate is the old test we used to do, which was the lactulose mannitol test. Um, and, and that test involved drinking a solution of lactulose and mannitol. And um, so that was the best way to determine a leaky gut. But since we hardly ever do that test, I include zonulin as a marker in the stool test. But I'm going to assume that most of my patients who have gut problems have a leaky gut. Um, if you see, if you run a, uh, if you run um, food sensitivity tests, and the patients come up with 30 different foods that they're sensitive to, you can assume they have a leaky gut. Actually, I know I said this was going to be the last question, but now you brought up another question. So <laughs> in, in that case, then you, you, if you if you do a food sensitivity test and someone shows up with 30 foods, so do you not tell them to avoid the foods and you just focus on healing the gut or do you heal the gut by telling them to avoid those 30 foods? Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> like everything else, if the patient's there primarily for gut health um, uh, or if we're just testing the gut because it's part of something else, um, you know, sometimes what I'll do is I'll look at those numbers and depending upon the test, only ask them to take out the foods that are the highest range. But, you know, I tend not to do a lot of food sensitivity testing because I find those tests not as helpful, partially because um, sometimes one of two things happens. They react to everything or they react to nothing except like oysters and they don't even eat oysters. Yeah. And either one of those are not clinically helpful. So I, I have not found um, for most of the time food sensitivity testing that helpful, but some of the patients want to run. Sometimes we are searching for answers. So we'll do it. Um, I, I, I also think so many people react to gluten and dairy that I, I know it can be helpful to test, especially if it's going to reinforce to the patient why they should need it. But it, it's it's it, a lot of times we just take out, ask them not to eat gluten or dairy. Yeah. I mean, I do the same thing. I'm not a big fan when it comes to food sensitivity testing. I just help have people go on elimination diet, definitely have them avoid the the gluten and the dairy. And so just, just cause you brought up that scenario. So I just wanted to see what you're, cause that, that again, I, I I've seen that too. I don't do a lot of food sensitivity testing, but if someone tests for like 30, 40 foods, and if a lot of them are healthier foods, you know, like broccoli and avocado and asparagus. And I, I agree. Like if someone does it on their own, and if they come back, I will just tell them, well, definitely avoid at least like the higher food you spent the money on it. You know, if you're a five, you know, depending on the test, let's say it's a scale of like, you know, one to five and there are five for avocados. I'll be like, ah, just to play it safe, just avoid the avocados and anything else that's really high. But, you know, typically it, it does relate to the gut. And that's really what we need to do is what, one, of, one of the big issues has to do with the fact that uh, after being in practice for so many years, I realized that what we say can have a big impact on people's lives. And, and you know, um, I know that some of my patients listen to me a lot more than my wife does. So um, they'll, they'll sometimes take what I say to their grave. So I'm careful about taking foods away from people. In my mind, sometimes I'm thinking, well, we'll just take it out for a few months. We'll take it out for three months and then test it back in. But depending upon the patient's mindset, if they're feeling better, uh, I, I have a number of patients who don't want to bring any of those foods back. And they end up with a very limited diet. And that's not healthy either. So I think we need a diverse diet with lots of different colored fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, 
quality proteins, etc. And I, I don't think we want to have a limited diet. And so, you know, if the person has any tendency towards um, anorexia, if they're very thin, um, you know, I'm really cautious about taking foods away from people. But yeah. we do it when we need to. Uh, we try to do it for short periods of time and try to emphasize the importance of bringing the foods back. And and then if they have a reaction, then maybe taking it out. That makes sense. And is there anything else you'd like to discuss? Anything that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? <laughs> or you want to just do a summary? Like if someone is wondering, do they have autoimmunity? You didn't, you like, didn't ask me thing? what's the airspeed velocity of a pigeon. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. That's a joke from Monty Python. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, I'm sorry for not being serious. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's, a, no, that's fine. I, I'm not a, Mon yeah, I'm not a Monty Python fan, so I, I didn't get it, but, uh, it's, it's... <laughs> but I got it. Yeah. A anyway, so to... <laughs> no, you, you could, you could definitely kid around on this podcast. You don't have to be a hundred percent serious. I, I forgot Do Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum. Have you spoke with him? I am um, not. Uh, you, you're familiar with them, though, from Fatigue to Fat Fantastic. It's a pretty popular book. No, I, I'm uh, not. Should yeah, if I you want, if, book? If, if if you want to have, well, I mean, if you want to have a, a real funny converse, I mean, he's a real funny guy. He's a good. I mean, it was a good conversation too. But I was like laughing like throughout the um, throughout the podcast. So that's <laughs> hopefully not so. with with arcane jokes that nobody gets. <laughs> No, but any, you know, anything else, if you want to, if you want to cover anything else, or again, if you just want to give a summary of like some of the most important things people could do if they're been diagnosed so, with an autoimmune condition, for example. Right. So that, let me just emphasize this for people who uh, are dealing with some level of autoimmunity and, and people don't even know they have autoimmunity. A lot of people have hypothyroidism. They're given Synthroid. End of story. But we know in the United States, the majority of cases of hypothyroid are um, related to autoimmunity. And um, patients go to rheumatologists, they're given some drug that lowers their immune system. And um, I think we've all learned that having an immune system that doesn't work very well is not a great thing, especially when there's dangerous viruses around or cancer, et cetera. So I, I think we have to spread the word that there's a reason why your immune system is attacking yourself and, and not just being, it's just not acceptable to simply take a drug that suppresses your immune system. <clears throat> now, look, I totally understand that there are autoimmune diseases like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, others that are, can be life-threatening. And so there's a place for these drugs, but even patients who take those drugs should see a functional medicine practitioner um, and they should work on trying to find the underlying triggers, why your immune system is attacking yourself because your immune system is not designed to attack yourself. It's designed to attack pathogens, foreign invaders, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it should not be attacking your own cells tissues and organs. And so if that's happening, um, a, you know, take whatever drugs you, that may be necessary to control the symptoms. Um, as you've been able to show, even a very serious condition like hyperthyroidism, um, which could damage the heart and everything else can often be controlled just using herbs and not taking the dangerous drugs. Um, other conditions, maybe you need to take those immune suppressing drugs, but try to work on the underlying triggers and then talk to your doctor um, after working, removing as many of those triggers as you can. If you can't possibly reduce the dosage or wean yourself off um, those immune suppressing drugs, uh, overall, you'll be healthier uh, by not having your immune system suppressed. All right. Well, thank you for summarizing that. And uh, where can people find out more about you, Dr. Ben? Again, here's you, you your podcast. Feel free to talk, talk about yes. your podcast again, okay. your website. Yeah. So check out 
Rational Wellness Podcast. You can go to Apple Podcasts. You can go to Spotify. You can see the video version on YouTube. Um, you can go to my website, drwhites.com. That's D-R-W-E-I-T-Z.com. You can find out more information about me, my clinic in Santa Monica, and um, I'm available for consultations for functional medicine, as well as for chiropractic. All right. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Dr. Ben. It was great chatting with you about autoimmunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Osansky.